You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wine, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanderson, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit hankgarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Laura Morelli on the show with me today. She has a phenomenal new book. It's called The Night Portrait, a novel of World War II and Da Vinci's Italy. And uh, this book is so fascinating, uh, Laura. I have thoroughly enjoyed it, and I know all of our listeners will, too. It's, you know, it, we're coming into fall now. And this is one of those books that you need to have uh, on your shelf or on your your table beside your bed, wherever you do your reading, uh, because this is something you need to get into this year. Welcome to the show, Laura. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled that you've enjoyed the story. Oh, I'm excited to have you. And and I have. Um, b- before we dig into that, uh, we begin each show with the same question. And that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, gosh. Well, I am one of those writers who always wanted to be one. I can remember being um, probably four or five years old and people would ask me what I wanted to be when I grew up. And I always said that I wanted to be either a writer or an archaeologist. And I'm I feel very fortunate now, all decades later, that I, I sort of got to do what I, what I set out to do <laughs> when I was four or five years old. You know, when I was in kindergarten, I used to write stories and uh, draw pictures and then cut up the paper and staple them together like books. Um, You know, I have to credit my parents because they read to me all the time when I was uh, a baby and a toddler. And so I just always had a book in my hand. I I loved reading the same stories over and over to the point where I memorized them. And so my life has just been one of, you know, love for books. I love that. Um, there, there's something that happens, you know, you, you said you were one of those kids that, that made books and, uh, uh, you stapled them together. And, uh, there, there's something that happens like when you're very young, it almost seems like books are ethereal. They, they just come from nowhere. They just show up and, you know, fully formed. And then there's something that happens in a, in a kid's brain where you realize someone made this, this, and that someone could be just like me, you know, could, we could be very similar. And if they could do it, I can do it. Um, and, and you were doing it as a, as a youngster. Do you remember, um, that awakening, that enlightenment, uh, that, that books were something that could be created? Yeah, I think so. You know, I used to love the library and the used bookstore in my hometown. Um, but, you know, I think even more than the physical object itself, I think I just had a love for the way that the language sounded, you know, and that just the kind of rhymes, you know, that you listen to when you're a little kid. Um, you and I were just talking off air. Both of us are Southerners. My my father, my grandparents were great storytellers. And I think when you grow up in the South around great oral storytellers, you know, you, you also develop an ear and a love for language and the way that it sounds. And um, so I think there was that element for me too, you know, something that I really gravitated toward. Do you, um, you mentioned that you knew that you wanted to be either a writer or an archeologist. And that, that statement made me smile so big. I wish you could see me Um, because I feel like a, a lot of writers feel that way that um that there's something about digging into the past and um excuse me my phone just buzzed over here let me move that um th- there's something about digging into the past and and coming up with the story of things it's like we know that things that we see there's a story behind that and that's really oh, 100%. what, what an ar- yeah, that's what 100%. an archaeologist wants to do they want to they want to find things of course but they they want to know what the story is behind it. And and that's what really fascinates us, isn't it? 
Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I sort of um, got diverted along my career path (laughs) because when I um, got to the end of college, um, I took my first art history class and I was like, there are all the stories, you know, of all the stuff, of all the interesting paintings and objects. And, you know, they all had stories attached to them. And I was just absolutely riveted. And so I went on to study art history in graduate school. I got a PhD from Yale University, um, set off to be a great academic and and, um, classroom teacher. And I did teach at the college level for some years. Um, But, you know, there was always something there that was missing. And I, I found that one day I was at a scholarly conference and I I found myself kind of yawning in the back row and I thought, you know, something is wrong here because this is the most fascinating topic in the entire world. And somehow we in academia, you know, managed to make it dull and boring. And, you know, it dawned on me that art history is really a is really about stories and people. And it's just what you said. It's, you know, it's seeing a piece of material evidence, whether it be, uh, you know, an arrowhead or a grand oil painting from centuries ago and realizing that there is there's a fascinating story behind it. And so that's sort of what led me to historical fiction and especially to writing about those stories of the history of art, some some better known than others. But that for me is such a joy and so much fun to do that research. So um, help us understand, uh, Laura, what art history is, because I think uh, for a lot of people, we think about art history and we we think about those first um, year or two of college when uh, no matter what your specialty is going to be, everyone's uh, getting their basics out of the way. And a lot of these classes that everybody takes and, you know, along the way, there's an art history course. Maybe there's an art appreciation or a music appreciation. There's something that that goes into art history that, um, and, and a lot of people say, well, I, I just need to get this art course out of the way. Um, but what is it that, um, first off, what is an art historian and why should we be paying more attention to art history than most of us are? Oh, wow. That's the, you asked some really interesting questions. Um, you know, art history is one of those wonderful fields that really doesn't have a lot of practical application. So I found <laughs> outside <laughs> of academia, and some people are surprised to find that when they go pursue it. But it is um, one of those disciplines, sort of like philosophy, um, you know, that, that manages to stay within uh, within academia. But it's, um, you know, it's it's like studying history, but it's really looking at the material past and, you know, learning about uh, what people cared about, what they valued, what they wanted to last in, in past centuries. I think art objects give us a particular kind of window on, uh, on the past and really help us understand what it was that people valued and what they were trying to communicate about themselves or about their culture. Um, and so, you know, I, I feel that the arts really, um, they make life worth living for a lot of people. Imagine a world without art and music and dance and those things that we as human beings are for some, for whatever reason, compelled to do. Um, you know, it would be a very different world indeed. Um, and it's one of the themes that I really wanted to explore in the night portrait um, when, you know, during World War II, people were forced to face these questions of the value of saving a work of art versus the value of saving a life. And, you know, how, how do you weigh those things and how do you measure them? And that, to me, is a fascinating question. So, Laura, you have an amazing website and uh, you take um, uh, you you really walk us through um, this great story on on your website about the transition from art historian to um, uh, historical fiction author and and authors. When you're listening, take a note from Laura's website, get yourself a great looking website and something that people can really sink their teeth into. Um, it's amazing, but uh, tell us well, a little bit you. about what well, you're you. welcome. Um, uh, 
walk us through a little bit about this um, this transformation that happened in you and the realization um, that you were really an author at heart and and how this uh, the, you know that this this journey that you went on on uh, you know from historian to author. Yeah, it was um, it was definitely a circuitous path. I started out um, as I mentioned teaching at the college level, and um, you know in academia you the the most sought after positions are tenure track positions. And um, as I was finishing graduate school. I had interviews with um, for some very attractive tenure track jobs, but um, I had a, an, a, an itinerant husband and um, we were, you know, starting a family and it was going to be difficult to reconcile, um, you know, our, our careers and our family life. And at the same time, um, we were, my husband and I were living in Italy and I made a, what at the time was a very difficult decision to jump off the train of a tenure track academic job that I had worked really hard for many years to pursue. Um, at the time I thought, oh boy, I'm jumping off this train and I'm never going to be able to get back on. As it turned out, it was the best decision of my life because um, it opened up so by closing that door, it opened up so many other doors. And I um, began the, the journey sort of began because uh, we as I mentioned, we were living in Italy and I started to study some of the contemporary Italian artisans who lived in my little region. And it opened my eyes because I realized that the Italian artisans who were practicing trades like uh, blowing Murano glass or making gondolas or uh, sculpting clay and making pottery were doing the same things that their ancestors from the medieval guilds were doing. And so for me as an art historian, it was fascinating because it was like a window into the past. And um, I started by writing a book called Made in Italy, a nonfiction travel guide that took travelers beyond the tourist traps to find authentic goods and help them understand what was authentic and what was imported from elsewhere. And um, started, you know, as a nonfiction author, I had a series of books published by Rizzoli, and um, it was a really fabulous project, um, something that I was very passionate about. And it gave me the opportunity to come face to face with artisans who were practicing these trades that stretched back hundreds and hundreds of years. And it was through the process of interviewing some of these artisans that I began to envision, you know, the past a little bit more and the creative side that had been buried since I was a little kid started to emerge again. Um, you know, I, I sat and talked with one of the last remaining gondola makers in Venice who was practicing traditional trades uh, passed on from his grandfather and many generations before. And the same story that I heard over and over again was it's so important to us to pass on these trades to the next generation. And I thought, well, I wonder what would happen if the heir were not willing or able for whatever reason to pass on this tradition, to pass this torch to the next generation. So this idea of the gondola maker and his sort of complicated relationship with his son uh, popped into my head. And it was a story that sort of germinated there for several years. And um, on my 40th birthday, my husband turned to me and said, so what are you going to do to mark your 40th birthday? And I said, I think I'm going to go swim with dolphins. And then I thought, that is so dumb. I'm going to write a novel. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I set out to write out to write this novel, which became The Gondola Maker. And it was such an awesome project that I, I never looked back. I, I thought, okay, this is really what I was supposed to do was to to kind of marry my interest in art history with historical fiction. And I, I think of historical fiction sort of like one of those uh, giant puzzles that you probably put together when you were sure. a kid that ha has a thousand pieces in it. And, you know, you open the box and it has the picture on the lid and you pull out the the edge pieces and maybe you've got some 
image in the middle that you can sort of make out and you start to piece it together. But there's still a bunch of holes all through the puzzle. And I, I feel like writing historical fiction is sort of like putting one of those puzzles together. You you have, you know, a skeleton or you have bits and pieces, you have edges, you have corners, you have other features that are in focus and then other things that are missing, pieces that are missing. And it's that exercise of putting together the pieces that we know and then imagining the rest that for me is a, a, a really exciting thing to do. So, you know, that's what we all want to know. Um, not, not only do we want a, a list of historical facts, but we want to know what was going through the minds of the people um, that these historical events remind us of. Um, and and that's the that's the great thing about historical fiction, isn't it? it that it gives us um, through educated guesses, um, it, it gives us some texture to the story to make these people feel like they were really alive because they they really were. Um, but a, as a historical fiction writer, how do you balance the things that you can prove with the things that uh, that you get to embellish? You know, it's um, it's interesting to me. Every time I visit a book club um, via Zoom, the first question is always, "Well, what parts of this story really happened, and you know, what parts of the story were made up?" And so I always try to um, really explain that in my author note in the back of the book. I also have um, a section in my website for each one of my books where readers, when they're finished with the story, they can go to this particular part of my website. And there's a lot of behind the scenes material um, for the night portrait. For example, I have a, a long post about what we know about Cecilia Gallerani, who's one of the main characters. I have a post about what it was like to walk around Milan in Leonardo da Vinci's day. Um, I have a post about um, this particular castle in Krakow, Poland, where some of the scenes are set. Uh, lots of pictures, videos, things like that, that I hope will enhance the, uh, the, the kind of fact behind the fiction, but people always want to know it. And it's, um, it is always an, uh, you know, an art. And I think, I think if a historical novelist has done his or her job, all of that research should be invisible in the book itself should be, it should just sort of fade away and you should be lost in the story. You know, I think of the really great historical novelists of our time, Ken Follett, for example, you know, if you read sure. Pillars of the Earth, which is one of the greatest historical novels, you know, you are immediately sort of plopped down in medieval England and um, you, you just care about what happens to those characters. And I'm sure he did years and years of research about, um, you know, cathedrals. And I, I studied the Middle Ages for years. But as soon as I opened the pages of those of that book, all of that info dump sort of disappears <laughs> to the background. And I just want to know what happens to this poor guy who just got confronted on his horse on in the woods. You know, I want to know what happens to the characters. And I think that's a mark. That's the mark of good historical fiction. Noveler is the best way to write a novel. Why? Quite simply because we've made it the easiest place to do it. Writing a novel is hard enough. Noveler takes care of all the logistical bits of writing a novel, just leaving that small matter of the words to you. It's a clean, beautiful writing interface with writing analytics, goals and streaks, advanced grammar checking, version control, day, evening, and night modes, and many other features designed to take all the stress out of writing. Tell us what you need and we'll build it. Together, we'll build a better tool. With a design-led approach, all the right tools that you need, Noveler saves all your words constantly, allows you to manage and order your novel easily. It's accessible from any device, desktop or mobile. It syncs to Google Drive and Dropbox. It allows exports in various formats, including ebook and more. It also has nice touches like allowing you to write both offline and online, unique for a web-based platform. 
Everyone needs help with their writing from inspiration through to grammar checking, so we're doing our best to provide that support. We integrate that support directly into Noveler. Our advanced grammar checker powered by Pro Writing Aid does everything from spell check to style advice. Our writing courses include the incredible Tim Clare's Couch to ADK. We're really excited to offer all Author Stories listeners 30% off Noveler for a whole year. And it doesn't matter if you choose to sign up for the monthly or annual plan. You'll get 30% off. All you need to do is use the discount code HANK when you sign up. Noveler, N-O-V-L-R. That's noveler.org. So, Laura, one of the the most um, uh, popular uh, elements of, of historical fiction uh, over the last couple of years has been World War II and this time period. Um, there, there just seems to be an insatiable hunger uh, from historical fiction readers that just want more and more stories um, about this time period, about the people that were involved. And we've seen, excuse me, um, we've seen a, a couple of movies, uh, a couple of books that have come out uh, over the last few years about the um, the the Nazi um, uh, thievery of art uh, that happened during this time. And I feel like that that's that we know a little bit about this. We know that it happened, but we don't know a lot about it. Um, what was the, the first inspiration for this story and what was it that intrigued you about this time period and maybe the events surrounding this time? Well, it's interesting that you mentioned, um, the popularity of world war two. I, um, have always felt, um, s- such a, I guess I, I would say just a negative emotion around watching documentaries or reading books or anything that has to do with, um, you know, senseless violence around that happened during World War II, and especially the Holocaust, which for me is just such a horrific time period that I think I probably avoided it, uh, yeah. avoided researching it and thinking about it and dwelling on it. But I happen to have a my oldest child who is um, a World War II aficionado. He knows all the planes. He knows all the main characters that, you know, the, in the battles and the battlefields. He's just he, he can't get enough. He, he's such um, such a World War II buff. And so when he was um, just before he left for college, he invited my husband and myself to come join him on the couch and watch a World War II documentary. And I thought, oh, I really want to go and read a novel set uh, during the Middle Ages or the Italian Renaissance instead. But <laughs> in the name of family unity, yes, we're going to sit down and watch this documentary. Well, it just so happened that they made reference to a painting by Leonardo da Vinci called The Lady with the Ermine, which, of course, I knew. And I'm sure many of you out there listening have seen this painting. It's famous. And um, they mentioned that it happened to be in hanging on the wall in a home in Bavaria that belonged to Hans Frank, who was um, the butcher of Poland. He was um, executed at Nuremberg at the end of the war. And he was one of the you know, most prolific, quote unquote, collectors of um, of Italian painting during the Nazi regime. And I thought, you really couldn't make that up, that a painting by Leonardo da Vinci was hanging in this guy's home in Bavaria. So how did that happen? So while the documentary was going on, I'm sitting there on my phone and I'm Googling the lady with the ermine and I'm starting to read a little bit more about the World War II history. And I knew already something about its um, its making, its original history in the 15th century. And this story just sort of stayed with me for days after watching this documentary. I just it was something that wouldn't let me go. And I went back and read more and more and more about the lady with the ermine. And suddenly this story in two timelines kind of emerged because on the one hand, the the story of the sitter in this painting, which um, Google it if you can't think of it right off the top of your head, but it's a beautiful young woman holding a white furry creature in her arms. 
And um, on the one hand, she was a fascinating historical character. She was a, a teenage girl who became the mistress of the de facto Duke of Milan. And um, on the other hand, you, you have this incredible World War II heist and rescue of this painting um, at the end of World War II. And the Monuments Men, who you may know, there was, there was sure. a famous movie made about it and a yeah. book by Robert Edsel. And um, they were involved in the recovery and the return of this painting to its rightful owners in Poland. Um, and it's just such an epic story and such an incredible true story that um, I just knew that it would make a, a fantastic research project and, and a, a great historical novel. So um, you – we have these historical pieces, um, kind of the the big set pieces that we know uh, that that you know that you're going to write about. Um, tell me about the characters that come alive in this time, and and who who inhabits the story. The night portrait has four narrators: um, Leonardo da Vinci being one. Uh, there are two men and two women. Um, Cecilia Gallerani, who I mentioned, was the mistress of the Duke of Milan is one of our narrators. Um, she was probably about 16 years old at the time. Uh, we believe that when Da Vinci painted her, she was pregnant. And her tenure in the castle of uh, the Ducal Castle of Milan was relatively short. Um, when she left, um, we believe that she took the portrait with her, uh, probably because Ludovico Sforza was married um, during the time that Cecilia was in the castle. And there's some evidence to suggest that there was a great, um, you know, scene made between between the wife and the mistress of the Duke of Milan. And shortly thereafter, Cecilia left with da Vinci's portrait in her possession. Um, another character is Edith, who is living in Munich in 1939 when the Nazis invade Poland. Edith is a very modest conservator working in a basement workshop in the Alta Pinacotec, the uh, the art museum in Munich, and her life's work is to save paintings. Well, instead, she's been put in the service of the Nazis and is partly responsible for the theft of um, not only the lady with the ermine, but many other priceless works of art. What fascinated me about Edith was to wonder what it would be like to be a person tasked with this job because in Nazi Germany, there were many art professionals, curators, muse museum directors, art historians, academicians, critics, who were corralled into this effort that was on an absolutely massive scale. I mean, it's really mind boggling when you look back and see the number of priceless works of art that the Nazis actually did manage to take. Um, they were very keen on taking every known painting by Leonardo da Vinci. They almost succeeded. Um, the Mona Lisa was one exception to that um, because the Louvre did a good job of hiding her um, through the, the war. But, um, but da Vinci's Lady with the Ermine was one of the first targets uh, for, for the Nazi theft. And so it was taken right at the beginning of the invasion of Poland in 1939. So we hear from Edith as well. Um, our two male protagonists are Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci on the one hand, who's uh, trying to make his way in the ducal castle of Milan in the service of, of Ludovic, Ludovico Sforza, who we think was sort of a um, a friendly character in toward Leonardo, but on the other hand, we know from history that he was also a very brutal man. And um, then we also hear from a young man named Dominic, who is one of the monuments. He works in the service of the monuments men. He doesn't start out as a monuments man. He's a coal miner from Pittsburgh. He's enlisted as a, a private in a military police unit. And he is assigned to protect some of the the uh, American soldiers who are part of the Monuments Men mission. And so Dominic is conflicted on the one hand, as, as most soldiers, I think, probably 
uh, wanted to. He wanted to go in, do the right thing, do do his job, and then return home to his wife and his baby. But along the way, he starts to question the value of human life and the value of art. And so his thoughts about that change over the course of the novel. Writing a character like uh, Leonardo has to be fascinating and daunting uh, at the same time because uh, what a fascinating character, uh, first off. Um, but you know, the, the farther we get away from uh, a, an historical event or a historical characters, the the less we retain of of kind of the um, you know their their personality. Um, how fun was it getting to take such a lightning rod of a character and bring him back to life? Yeah, I I agree that it's incredibly daunting. And um, earlier this year, I released another book called The Giant, which is a novel of Michelangelo's David. And even though Michelangelo is not the primary narrator of that book, that book took me 20 years to finish. <laughs> and I think it's because you you do feel this burden of responsibility, not only for these giants of the Italian Renaissance like Leonardo da Vinci or Michelangelo, but you know, many of the World War II characters and many of us historical novelists who are writing stories set in the 20th century are writing in the very recent past. And we're writing about characters who may have um, children still living or grandchildren still living. So there is a tremendous burden, I think, to um, respect the historical record and to document um, everything. You know, at the same time, it's a novel. And so we we have to balance those things, I think. Um, but to your question about writing about Leonardo da Vinci, it has been a lot of fun. And what I found interesting about this particular chapter in Leonardo da Vinci's life is it's a time when he's, he's a grown man, but he's still relatively young. He's uh, in his 30s when he goes north. He leaves Florence, um, goes to seek his fortune, and he's obsessed with making his fortune as a military engineer and designer. His notebooks from this Milanese period are filled with drawings of all kinds of crazy contraptions, things that look like um, gigantic crossbows that um, can be wheeled around <laughs> town, <laughs> things that can explode bridges and mines, um, contraptions where you could scale a fortified wall um, underground tunnels that would allow people to go under a moat and attack a castle from inside. And when you look at these notebooks from this period, you see that he's just, his mind is just churning with all of these military contraptions. And he's thinking, what can I do, you know, to, um, to, in the service of this, you know, very violent, powerful man who's hired me to work in his court. And um, we also have a fascinating letter from this period where Leonardo da Vinci has presented himself to Ludovico Sforza, the, the de facto Duke of Milan, and um, he explains all of his qualifications. Um, he explains that he's able to design all of these military contraptions like the ones I described. And at the very end of this letter, he says, oh, and by the way, in times of peace, I can also paint. And so the, the painting, you know, the Leonardo da Vinci as a painter, which is, of course, what we think of primarily today, was at that time for him sort of an, a footnote, sort of an afterthought. And um, so that um, provided a pathway for me in terms of a way to, uh, in terms of characterization, a way to... Um, get into the head of, of Leonardo da Vinci during this Milanese period and sort of understand what his motivations were um, when he was then tasked to sit in front of this young woman and paint her portrait. And I, that's, I think, what made him fascinating to me as a character for this project. Well, one thing that I love about this book is I learned things uh, about our recent past and um, uh, you know, um, it, it added texture and and character to the stories that I had heard 
about, you know, what happened just, uh, you know, less than a century ago. Um, but it also gave me a, a broader uh, appreciation for, um, you know, why these uh, pieces of art were so wanted uh, by the Nazis. And, and um, it, it really filled out this this uh, experience for me. And, and I think that's what great historical fiction will do is we feel like we've been on an adventure with someone and we've learned something along the way. Um, do, do you um, do you think of your role as a historical fiction author uh, in the same terms um, as as a as an art historian? Um, do you do you compare those two roles that you play and do you see that they work hand in hand? Um, you know, it's uh, very helpful to me to have that kind of research background and and to really um, be able to read, you know, original sources and things like that. But I really do see art history and art histor- and art historical fiction as, you know, two completely separate genres. Um, I still teach, you know, st- kind of straight art history courses online and I still love it and it still provides an endless source of inspiration for me and and I really enjoy it. But the historical fiction is a different animal completely. Um, It really is. And as I said, if, you know, if I've done my job, then it doesn't feel like an info dump. It feels like what you just described, you know, where you've, you've been on a journey and Along the way, you've learned something cool that you didn't know before, or it sort of brought a period of time that you some sort of knew something about to life. And that those are the reasons why I love historical fiction, too. I mean, I, I love to, to read books that are set in locales or in settings that I, I don't really know that much about. Or, um, you know, I, I love to read books that are set in faraway places that I've never been to or about eras I don't know much about because I do come away learning something new and, and feeling like I've been on this fantastic adventure. Well, the new book is called The Night Portrait, a novel of World War II and Da Vinci's Italy. Um, Laura, I love this book so much. Um, I'm recommending it to everyone. Um, we're we're going to put links to it in the show notes of this episode because if if you're listening to this and this uh, our, our conversation has piqued your interest uh, about this topic and about this book, it's available everywhere today. You can go grab it uh, in Kindle edition or paperback or even audiobook, however you like to read it's available in those formats um laura tell people where they can find you online if they want to dig into all the great stuff that you do please sure uh you can just go to lauramorelli.com excellent we'll put links uh in the show notes to that as well and make it easy for people to find you uh laura this has been so much fun chatting thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today thank you hank this was my pleasure thank you so much for having me Authors, I have a fantastic new service to tell you about. It's called PubSite. PubSite is a service to help you build your very own website, your home on the web, where you can promote your work and give your fans a place to connect with you. PubSite is a website platform that allows every author, regardless of budget, to have a great looking professional website. Developed by the book marketing professionals at FSB Associates, PubSite is the new easy to use DIY website builder developed specifically for books and authors. Whether you're an author of one book or 20, or a small publisher, PubSite allows you to build, design, and most importantly, update your website pain free. No need to be dependent on a designer or webmaster to make a small but costly change to your website. Save the money and do it yourself. PubSite is the best platform for authors because it's a book-centric platform. PubSite was built just for authors and small publishers. Every design, feature, and layout is book-centric. They have customized designs for you to use. It's easy to build. No coding or HTML is necessary to create a stunning, professional-looking website with all the features you want. Get a custom domain name, yourname.com. It's simple to update. You can add all of your books, add a blog and a book tour, sell from any retailer, manage your email list and social media, and even do e-commerce. Build your website with a 14-day free trial, then pay just $19.99 per month, which includes hosting. And we offer packages starting at $499 to set up the website for you. Pub-site.com.
the place to help authors find their home on the web.